Delighted to be here. It's nice to see people in 3D, and I know many as, are joining us virtually as well. And, and I want to begin by thanking Jeff uh, in the uh, province of Ontario for those wonderful remarks. You know, I had the uh, good fortune in my previous role as a Minister of Innovation, Science, and Industry to work with uh, not only Jeff, but Vic Fidelli as well. Uh, when he came to some of these significant investments they talked about, particularly in the um, automotive sector, and I think a point of pride for us here in Ontario and in Canada was the fact that Ford Motor Company decided to set up its shop here in Canada when it came to the production of its new electric vehicles. And this was a big deal, these zero emission vehicles and batteries was a function of what Jeff said, which was leveraging the value proposition here in Ontario and looking at the nickel, cobalt, uh, lithium and other key ingredients that were going to be used for building batteries and zero emission vehicles here. So it just demonstrates there's a lot of innovation happening here and a lot of exciting things and it's, it's all about partnership and it's about exchanging ideas and it's about learning from one another. And that's why I'm delighted to be here today to moderate this conversation today uh, at the Toronto Global Forum. Uh, as I said, it, this is a place where you can exchange ideas in a very candid manner, talk about issues that really matter on pressing economic issues. Um, and earlier today, many of you heard a conversation about how do we redefine prosperity going forward? A lot of things were exposed during the pandemic, and these questions are emerging not only for government and policy, uh, governments and policymakers, but business leaders as well. And then of course, investing, and that's gonna be a key theme and focal point of our conversation today. As mentioned, uh, the theme for this panel is investing smarter, in uncertain times. And today with me, uh, I've got some two incredible individual panel members who know a lot about investing and who are well recognized and well regarded in the business community. I'll start to my left here, introducing here in the here live <laughs> in person, Blake Hutchison, who is the CEO and president of OMERS. And for those of you who don't know OMERS, it's the Ontario Municipal Employees Retirement System. Uh, and prior to taking on this role in 2018, uh, Blake was also the CEO of Oxford Properties. And a few years ago, he was named uh, Canada's top 40 under 40. So that was, a, what, I a, think... A long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and joining us uh, virtually and online, we have David Bloomberg, who is the founder and managing partner of Bloomberg Capital. He found this in the early 1990s and. I think a decade later is when you launched your first venture-backed fund. I think it was in 2001. And uh, David has done a tremendous job of supporting the innovation ecosystem, investing in companies, and a very active board and advisory member as well. So welcome both. Uh, and so glad to have you as part of this conversation this afternoon. So I, I think it's important to set the context because that's really important. Um, and, the, and the key word is uncertainty. There's a lot of it. You know, prior to the pandemic, and as we were entering into the pandemic, people were worried about what's going to happen to the economy, what's going to happen to the balance sheets, and clearly the predictions that were made, the dire circumstances that were highlighted didn't necessarily transpire. The economy rebounded well, there was growth, uh, balance sheets are strong. Uh, in 2020, just a year and a half ago, no one was talking about inflation. Now that's the only thing that <laughs> is being talked about in the financial news section uh, of any paper that you pick up. So clearly things are changing drastically and these are really challenging times. And so I'd like to pose this question to both of you, uh, Blake and David, and please feel free to, and I'll start off with you, uh, Blake, since you're here. You know, we're in these uncertain times and you know, businesses look for predictability, they look, uh, they look for an environment where you have a good idea of how to invest in the near and long term. But there's so much happening. There's so many challenges, so many issues that are emerging that I just highlighted. What are some of the guiding principles that uh, you uh, follow in terms of making your decisions? Uh, first of all, thank you. Nice to see people live. David, I didn't know it was an option, so, but he went to Harvard and Stanford and <laughs> Insead, so maybe he's smarter than me. 
but I would way sooner be here in person. I'll start by uh, saying, listen, this is a great, I'm, a, I, I'm privileged to lead a, a big pension plan here in Canada, but I'm an Ontarian and Canadian first, and this is a great place to be in these times. And um, when you listen to uh, Mr. Fidelli's uh, voice and what's going on in Ontario, it's positive. Thank you for your service to the country. I'm not beyond criticizing our governments. <laughs> and when this meltdown was coming into play, I took you know, notes because I wanted to look back and say what I've done the same thing as you were doing or the Bank of Canada was doing. And I'm here to say I'm totally impressed with the way the cards were played. And so number one is, do you have a stable country? Are you playing your cards right? And I fundamentally believe our country's done better than most and extraordinarily well, and I'm proud of it. So OMERS today is a, I can't say exactly because our numbers change, but they're changing in the positive direction. So I'll <laughs> call it a 110 to $120 billion plan. And we have a pretty good proxy on what's going on around the world. We own Oxford Properties. It's roughly $75 billion of assets under management. It's 70, 750 assets around the world. We own $25 billion worth of infrastructure, roughly $20 billion of good companies through our private equity platform, and $50 billion in the markets at any given day. So when you ask a strategy, they're all so different, right? Every business is different than the other. You have to really understand subsets of what's going on. And when the markets dropped out, uh, we were, I can say quite honestly, very concerned. The first quarter of 2020, markets dropped 40%. Canadian dollar, dollar dropped 15%. We had hedges on all around the world. We had to post, I'm going to say, between $5 and $8 billion worth of capital to, to meet those hedges. None of us knew whether the Canadian dollar goes to 50 cents. Yep. So it was a pretty scary time. And then what do you do? You don't panic. You collect your team. You recognize that, uh, as Dorothy said, when the whirlwind goes like this, you, you're never going back to Kansas. So what's <laughs> the new world look like? That's right. And what we were able to do is, um, is tweak our strategies, but they were great long-term strategies. Since June of 2020, what we've reported so far is an 18% return for the first year hence, and about nine for the first six months of this year, and it's only gotten better. So the economy is good. If we're a proxy for what's going on out there, I'm very encouraged. Some of the stimulus that the governments have provided, I think, has got some businesses ahead of where they might have been. But this is a time for optimism. Money is in people's pockets. Uh, good businesses are doing well. That period is behind us, and this new opportunity presents some risks, no question, but how do you get risk on and the things you believe in in a post-pandemic? So every single business we've had, we've taken that lens. It's a K-shape. What's good? What's bad? Let's put our way in the front of this trend, you know, down weight, get out of this trend. And I like our odds, and I like the future, and we can get into inflation and other headwinds, but on balance, it's a good news story. Well, thank you for that, Blake. You know, it's incredible, as you said, you know, and the, to your point around how dire the situation was and the strategies that you deployed and the returns you're talking about. Uh, you're very optimistic and uh, forward-looking. Uh, you're feeling very good about things. David, do you share that optimism? Do you share that mindset? Uh, and if you can speak to a little bit about your strategies during the pandemic and what worked, uh, you know, what enabled you to weather the storm, so to speak, and set you out for success going forward? Thank you very much. Thank you, Navdeep. And uh, Blake, great to hear your point of view. Yeah. You know, Blake represents a very, very massive organization that has a very diverse set of holdings and good for the people that are pension funds from pensioners uh, with OMERS. Lumberg Capital, on the other hand, is very, very focused. We're an early stage venture capital fund. So we invest in the pre-seed, seed rounds, and we like to lead those and, and A rounds. So we're, we're the first institutional money in typically. So we're pretty focused on only investing in technology. We don't do real estate or other things. We do prop tech, which is a new way of <laughs> doing real estate in the virtual manner. And that's really what I wanted to mention and highlight on is the virtualization of the world that we've seen. Um, it's, it's very clear that, that uh, COVID was you know, a, a tragedy in the human sense uh, for, for all of us around the world. And yet with every dark cloud, there are silver linings. And in this case, the, the silver line that we found, we even created a new acronym instead of COVID coronavirus identified in 2019. Ours is COVID catalyst C of virtualization V innovation I 
and decentralization. I was going to go backwards. Um, <laughs> so the, the point is that what we saw was an incredible uptake and an uplift in our businesses that were using virtual services. I'll give you an example in digital health because the Mr. Yurek uh, the, talked earlier about how Ontario province is so strong in the healthcare area. That's true. And uh, I'm, I'm a former, I lived in Montreal for many years, so a very love, love Canada. Uh, now I'm in warm Montreal, so I'm sorry, I was in Montreal. Now I'm in warm Miami, very different situation. But uh, we're, we're tied together, these two countries, uh, as part of the global um, ecosystem. So back to the, the, this COVID uh, transition, the digital health numbers are pretty astonishing. Since 2020, the new numbers are 38 times more telemedicine consults were able to be had. That partly was due to some deregulation a couple of years ago in the US, which allowed doctors to uh, prescribe and, and work across state boundaries, which is very, very helpful. So anytime we can get rid of barriers um, and allow people to be more virtual, that's in probably increasing in productivity. Um, if we talk about innovation, um, we've been investing very actively. I imagine Omer's is as well. This has been an incredibly strong time for exits. So our entrepreneurs are being able to sell their companies or take them public. The public markets are very strong right now. The um, decentralization is another interesting uh, factor. We saw people clearing out from some of the center cities uh, more to the suburbs and then exurbs and moving just all around uh, to live a better life, frankly, find a work balance. I and my family moved from San Francisco to Miami during this period. And a number of our companies have moved around to Texas and other places, um, mostly in the Sun Belt. But what we're seeing is that it's not going to probably be a complete return to the traditional office block, everyone in the same place. There's more flexibility on the part of employers to allow people to work from distributed places. And so just as some very, very large corporations are called multinational, we have, we're funding companies that from their birth are multinational. They, are, they have an engineering team, perhaps in India, and a headquarters in San Francisco, and a sales office for Latin America in Miami, and so on and so forth. So we're seeing a great deal of this uh, catalyst for um, virtualization, innovation, and decentralization. And I think, as Blake said, I don't think it's going to go back to the past. I think there's a happy medium that will come a little bit more decentralized, um, more resilient, more flexible and more dependent on, on, on virtualization. I'll just give you one example that I can hold up right here. Um, in FinTech, we're, we're major investors in the FinTech category. You know, this was my wallet in the old days, like a year and a half ago, classic wallet with credit cards and cash. And this is my new wallet. I, I do almost everything, I, my, my banking, my cash transactions, my tipping, my restaurants, all of it seems to be done through the phone. Uh, this was commonplace, I think, in Asia prior, but it was this pandemic that allowed uh, Americans, Canadians to move much more of their business for fintech online. So I'll just pause there, but I, I'm also optimistic. It's a, sad that we had to have, go through a pandemic and that tragedy, but the outcome will make us more resilient and safer for the next uh, pandemic to come. Well, I, th I think we'd take either either one of those wallets. We'll take either, <laughs> take either of those. <laughs> uh, wonderful. No, look, uh, I think, uh, David, you articulated such a, a coherent message around not only the optimism why you share that, with the investments in technology, but it's really that digital transformation that's uh, been accelerated. Uh, initiatives that would have taken enterprises and society maybe decades uh, took place in months, and that was incredible. And so that transformed many things, including how people work. And, and David, you highlighted this uh, back to work conversation that's uh, definitely top of mind for many uh, business leaders. Um, and so I guess the question for you, uh, Blake, because we were talking about this earlier, you have a strong footprint in the office, in the building space, in real estate. As uh, companies are looking at this hybrid format, what are you seeing in terms of some of the investment strategies that you're deploying in light of this new hybrid model that's emerged uh, because of the pandemic? Uh, fair question. So we've really been, um, we have, Oxford today has about 15% retail, 25, 30% office, and then we've been risk on on industrial, multifamily, and life sciences. And that Oxford five years ago was primarily office and retail. So we were anticipating, we had 30 retail assets five or seven years ago, we're down to less than 10. And to your point, the pace of change, we anticipated right from the dot-com days, we were saying there's going to be a point at which 
Retail footprints will shrink, industrial product will grow, don't know when it'll happen, wasn't nearly as quickly uh, rolled out as people anticipated you know, 20, 15 years ago, and then it happened overnight. Now we were on our toes and it played into our strengths and it's worked very well. But to your specific question on Office, listen, I don't think Office is, I think it's getting unnecessarily hammered, and I'll qualify that. I think there's probably 20% less ambition for new office space uh, on a global trend basis as people find ways to work at home and, and other ways. Then there's a 10% greater demand for elbow room because when you go to the office you need more elbow room. The net is 10. Most leases are five years, so that would be a 2% diminution in demand over five years. And there's a massive migration towards great buildings. Great buildings with mechanical, electrical, new assets, you know, we own Hudson Yards in New York. I was there last week. We've never seen uh, rent demand at these prices ever because of the brand new, state-of-the-art, great office buildings and 80-year-old you know, office stock can't compete. So I think there's a movement towards uh, mechanical and electrical will be the rule of the day. Better office buildings will do well. I think there's a disconnect, bid-ask spread right now between those who think office buildings should be discounted significantly and those who actually trade. And I think that the best buildings will do just fine. I think the secondary assets will do less fine. And I don't think there's any question, we're all gonna allow a little more flexibility and choice. And I think that that's part of what we've learned is we can get great things done during these times. But most offices wanting to build culture will have a significant component in place, come to work please, let's build our culture around each other. So more flexibility, more choice, but the office building's not going away. And I think that'll be proven out, not in the first year, but over second, third, and fourth year. Correct. I do believe it's still early stages as this is unfolding and companies are adapting. And so, Blake, if I can start with you on this, and then we'd love to get your thoughts as well, David. In, in terms of, you talked about culture. You talked about this hybrid model and accommodating uh, employees, accommodating uh, people in terms of their ability to work from home and come to the office. But that is a, a bigger, the bigger issue there is really about how do you attract talent, retain talent, and develop talent. It's, it's, we're seeing now with inflation and the conversations around that, uh, there's many different factors that come into play. Labor shortages is one component of that. And how do you uh, develop a culture where you can obtain and keep talent? And there's a conversation that's taking place around the great resignation. And there's some anecdotal stories about this. There's some data starting to emerge about this where people, especially younger people, are reflecting, or people even mid-career are reflecting on where they're working, does it have impact, uh, is it a purpose-driven organization, and how can they reskill or upskill or try something different? So in that context, first of all, I guess, uh, to, to you, David, um, I'll start off with you actually first and then come back to you, Blake. David, do you see this in, in your companies in terms of, um, firms challenge with, with issues around skills and talent. And if you're seeing this issue, what are companies doing to not only attract but retain talent? I think that's something that people would love to know from your experiences in the companies that you're dealing with in the startup ecosystem. Sure. Okay, great. I'm going to answer two parts of it. Uh, first is the war for talent, so to speak. That's been with us since 2000, really, 17. It's been very, very... Um, robust employment atmosphere. Companies are growing. There's a dynamism in the economy. And <clears throat> people have really been trying to hire. And it's especially true in our realm of software development. That's mostly what we invest in. And so those uh, software engineers are in super high demand. So you mentioned Toronto and the Ontario um, areas, uh, great university systems and so on. And I would extend that to to Canada in general, you have an extremely well-educated workforce. We have four or five companies in Canada. All of them are doing well. A couple of them are unicorns now. So good. <laughs> rah, rah for the Maple Leafs. Yeah. Love it. And, uh, Love it. Sounds like a good place for us to find talent. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that, that's, that's a war. So, you know, treating people better, allowing them, allowing them to have more flexibility, as we've talked about in terms of where they work. I noticed that in LinkedIn recently they advertised 357% increase in work from anywhere hostings uh, just recently over a year ago. So that's pretty interesting. Then uh, let's talk about the issue of productivity because ultimately wages are tied to productivity. 
And it was that in the 19th century, the agricultural workers received an enormous amount of tools and engineering for tractors and so on that made them much more productive. In the 20th century, it was the factory workers. Today, we believe that the office workers, the knowledge workers, and the service economy, which is probably 80% of the Canadian and US and OECD uh, workforce, mm -hmm. needs more productivity. So what we're looking for as software investors is using AI, artificial intelligence, to analyze big data. And new sources of big data are coming online from many places. The, the banks have opened up uh, through APIs, application programmer interfaces, to release a lot of their information. There are new sources of data from social media, from many, many sources, intelligent roadways and buildings and so on. So we have a lot of more sensor data and, and data to analyze. So what we say is we're looking uh, to the past to analyze the data that's already here, taking stock of the present and helping predict the future. And what we're seeing is in fintech, in health tech, their healthcare area, uh, and, and supply chain and logistics, to name three, massive productivity gains from this anal analysis of prior data. It's interesting fact that 95% of data historically has never been used after it is logged and archived. Mm -hmm. And so what we're finding is like a coal and a diamond, diamonds in the coal mine analogy, that there is a lot of coal, and then there are some diamonds in there that have been, you know, hidden for too long and using new algorithms and so on and also maybe maybe making workers more productive with software process automation we can do more with less we can make everybody more productive and more creative we can get rid of some of the mundane jobs the, the redundancy the the push the paperwork pushing or recopy one spreadsheet into another spreadsheet have it done more automatically so that the people can use their brain for thinking rather than just the rote work so I think the future is bright. We need to adopt some of these new technologies because that will be the way to raise wages. Um, wages really only increase when people have more productivity and are able to deliver more output per hour. So that is a way that we think uh, can move this forward. And it'll also help in a certain way to alleviate some of the shortage of talent because if we can do more with less, then perhaps each person that's working can be even more productive. So I'll pause there and if you have to come back with specifics, I'm happy to respond. No, thank you for that, David. Look, I think you're absolutely right. Technology and productivity are going to be key components of making up for some of the challenges that we're seeing in the labor market. Uh, and of course, I think, how do we retain uh, a talent? By empowering them, by giving them the tools to use, as you say, their creativity, their knowledge. Again, making sure that they are having more impact and getting away from some of those mundane tasks that you highlighted. But, but you know, it, it was mentioned before, and I think the issue around culture. Yeah. I would love to get your thoughts around that in terms of you mentioned that very deliberately. They say yeah. you've got to come back to the office. You've got to interact with people. Um, and so can you elaborate a bit on that? Because, again, it speaks to the broader thinking around firms and long-term um, investment strategies around the skills equation, the talent equation. We'd love to get your perspective. Please. That's fair enough. So I've been, I've, I've been pretty blessed. I think I've been a CEO of a company for 25 years or so of my career. And one of the things I've learned through running three businesses um, of size over that time is if your ambition is to get an outcome, a result, and I grew up as a ski racer, if you say get on the podium, you never get to the podium if you don't outwork people, get a team around you, get a trainer, worry about nutrition, work hard, work hard, time on snow, and then you get to the podium. I think the same is true of successful companies. If you focus on people, if you focus on culture, if you focus on brand, and if you focus on being forward-looking, results come. But it all starts with people. And when people go, what's the world going to look like five years from now? I'll go, I don't know. But I know if I have amazing people who are really forward-focused with a great culture and jealously protect my brand, we will figure it out. We'll get ahead of the curve. What's a business plan? It's what am I great at? How do I get in the way of a trend given limited resources? So let's get our people focused on what are we great at, what are the new trends, tweak, navigate. But it all starts with people, and it all starts with So how do you culture. retain talent? Like, I know the culture is so, important, but how do you... I think you're both highlighting two things. There's a, there's a net um, distribution of talent, people trading out the big quit, and then there's what's AI and technology doing Correct. to take out other pieces of your workforce. And they're both coming at us strong. They're both coming at everybody. To me, it's a, it's a pie. There's a component of it that's comp, and the other ingredients include feeling like you belong, 
inclusion and diversity, being good to each other, common good, common goals. We represent 530,000 uh, 530, people today. That brings our people together. And by the way, the less those other ingredients are there, the bigger that slice called comp has to be because people will compensate for the goodness you bring in the total pie and it's all about the math. And so there's a, there's a, there's a comp component, no question, but there is a feeling of belonging, a decency, a kindness, a culture where people come to work and I always say treat everybody, everybody fairly, not equally. You can't have all your team on the first line. <laughs> and those to me are the fundamental values in, in defending our people, in attracting great people, and in, um, in taking on that onslaught that we're seeing both from innovation and from just that, you know, um, partially COVID-induced, I want to look elsewhere. And we're not always getting it right. We're getting it right more than often. I've been in New York and London in the last two weeks. It's harder, to the culture point, to nurture offices outside of Canada in the same way that we do in Canada because they're just not close. And you're reminded how that is important. So those are just thoughts. No, those are really good thoughts. And I think when you talked about that pie, compensation, of course, is important. But you mentioned something that I think struck a chord with me and in, in, in many companies are really focusing on this, uh, which is, again, the whole notion of common good. And one of the areas that's being discussed is the long-term view around sustainability, about our environment. What kind of uh, future are we going to have 10, 15, 20 years from now in terms of the the quality of life people are going to be able to enjoy when it comes to clean air and clean water. And that's really taken on quite a bit of momentum in COP26. We're seeing a lot of conversations around how do we get off of coal? How do we um, move away from oil and gas, reduce our footprint when it comes to methane emissions? So there's been a lot of conversations in this space in terms of sustainability and a lot of momentum. And there's obviously a lot around disclosure as well. Under ESG, how do you measure success? What does success look like um, in this space as well? And there's a lot of capital out there now. I remember five years ago talking about long-term patient capital, uh, but now uh, there's green bonds being issued and uh, in, in significant amounts in the trillions of dollars globally as well. So I would love to get your thoughts on, around this common good, around how you view sustainability long-term, um, because again, that's the, the lens for today's conversation around these uncertain times is there's a lot of uncertainty when it comes to these conversations around policymakers. There's a bit of a patchwork within countries. There's a patchwork globally. We're trying to deal, countries are trying to deal with that issue. So my first question to you both, and I'll start off with you, David, are we moving too quickly in this? And if so, it, it, and I would love your thoughts on that, but also the role of technology, because again, this is an area that you're very familiar with. So if you can speak to, again, we know what the policymakers are saying around pricing pollution. We know what they're saying in terms of um, what they want to do in terms of dealing with deforestation and coal, et cetera. But technology and innovation are going to be a key part of this journey as well. And we'd love to get your perspective. Sure. Um, first, I would like to actually try and tie these two together because we talked about caring for people and culture and so on. And, and yet, in a, in a certain way, sometimes technology can play a really valuable role in making people's lives actually better uh, and, and, and in a real sense. And I'll give you an example of a Canadian company we're proud to be invested in. Um, it's called WorkJam, W-O-R-K-J-A-M. Uh, they're based in Montreal, selling all over the world. And they help uh, do workforce management and engagement. So they are tracking the hours of hourly workers. And many hourly workers, for example, Shell Oil is a customer and Avis and many of the big telcos and, and, and so on people that make the phones, not supposed to say their names. Um, <laughs> they, often these people work uh, you know, hourly and they live paycheck to paycheck. And that's going to be sometimes tough in the middle because sometimes about three, four, five, seven days before you get your next paycheck, you've run out of cash. And so um, WorkJam has come up with what we call embedded fintech solutions that people can draw down between their paychecks. So it's little things like that. Sounds little, it's technically complicated, but these are the kinds of things that employers can do to help folks maybe at the lower end of their pay scale uh, do better and manage with a more stable, sustainable um, salary. And it's a different term for sustainability, but ultimately for thinking about human flourishing, 
Remember, we, we need to remember that there are 3 billion people on Earth that use less electricity than a North American refrigerator. Okay? Wow. <laughs> 3 billion people. So the world needs a lot more power generation. A lot. And, and I will go out on a limb here. It may not be popular. I will state that I do not believe that the current technologies we have for energy production are anything close to what is need, needed. Um, we need new solutions. Um, and we actually need to look backwards into some prior, you know, in Toronto and in um, Ontario and, and Canada, you're blessed with such incredible hydropower resources. Most of the world doesn't have that. But there, there are a lot of things that are being shown as current um, solutions to uh, some of the th issues being discussed in, in Scotland at COP20 just aren't really ready. There, there isn't significant battery technology, for example, to store um, enough power and manage it through a proper grid. Uh, electrical um, formats that we have today in large cities and, and areas um, that would be from less reliable sources such as solar and, 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 and wind. So we really need to be doubling down on R&D and, and looking at, at new technologies that can meet those challenges because the current uh, technologies don't cut it. So that's on one side of the aisle. Yeah, on that but point, if I may, David, just very quickly. Yeah. So you're, I agree with your assessment. Energy, uh, you know, you had Biden on one hand saying we got to get off of oil and gas. And uh, I think the next day he was talking to the OPEC leaders and saying we need a higher, we need more, we need more oil uh, at the same time to deal with the, the rise of energy price points uh, that consumers are facing. So you talked about technology and new solutions. Anything that you can identify for the audience in terms of yes. something that you're seeing with the companies that you're working with? We just invested in a company that will have certainly some significant Canadian uh, and South American connections because of the mining activity that is so um, important in those areas and say in Australia and in Africa and other places in Central Asia. But this is a company called Ver.ai, V-E-R.ai. And this is essentially um, folks who came from a military intelligence background and saw that the mining um, risk ratio reward was really, really high for what they um, saw. And they said, gee, it's a thousand to one often on that a, that a mine will actually prove out and pay out um, profitably. And so they said, we need a lot more minerals, uh, rare earth metals, to, to give an example right now for battery technology. So they, they started using, again, big data, taking U.S. geological survey data and other open source and other private source data, adding it to uh, what the geologists for the private mining company were working with and uh, helping them uh, reduce the risk and making a thousand to one payoff, something more like a 10 to one. And what they do in terms of putting their money where their mouth is, they're actually willing to trade that um, value for a stake in the mine. So it's an interesting business model innovation. I think that's common maybe in the exploration and production industry. And then also using this big data idea to say, okay, the geology is the same, but if we come at it with more data, we're probably going to find more insights. So that's a way of reducing the cost, also reducing the waste. Mining is a very uh, expensive and, and dirty industry, and it causes a lot of CO2 output. So if we can reduce the amount of mining we need by finding better pay dirt uh, in a smaller concentrated area uh, and less wasted holes, uh, we're going to do better for the world. That's just one example that's very current and right in our new portfolio. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, David. So, Blake, to, to, to you on this question. Yeah. I mean, this is obviously talked at any, any board now is seized with ESG, uh, senior management seized with this issue. I've given the global context as well. So how are you dealing with this issue from a long-term perspective? Yeah, no, I think, I think it's become table stakes. I was at this um, investors conference in London a couple of weeks ago. 120 invitations. I was privileged to get one of them. There were four Canadians representing about a trillion dollars, which felt kind of mighty. And then you looked around the room and there was $25 trillion <laughs> represented in this room of 120. And it was hosted by the Prime Minister and Bill Gates and the CEOs of Blackstone and BlackRock and JP Moore and the like. And I just sat mesmerized for, for 12 straight hours listening person after person after person. There isn't... Uh, a wafer of uh, room to argue anymore with big capital sources as to what this means to society to get in the game and to do your level best to contribute to to the world and and to our uh, you know to our global ecosystem. It creates massive opportunities. It also creates some risks. So we're we're very focused. And I'll give you some examples. So about ten years ago, uh, back when I was running Oxford. 
I just made a simple statement one day. We will be a leader or the leader as a green real estate company in the, in the coming decade. And when you say that and the smart people around you pick up on it, Oxford became, has become one of the global leaders in the space. Um, just this year was named a top 10 fast growth company, uh, has won the Gresby Awards for North America for the most green development platform uh, from a real estate standpoint in the continent. Uh, is building the first green office building in Canada out in Vancouver. If anyone needs office space, talk to us. Um, <laughs> and we've said recently under my watch, we will be a leader or the leader in this space for Omers. And we are um, very much embracing it as opposed to repelling it. And much like your single solution, where we own half of Bruce Power, which has made a net zero commitment by, by now in 2027, We've invested in wind and solar platforms in the United States. We've just invested in, a, I think, a very state-of-the-art uh, energy solution in India. Uh, we're doing the same with, with private equity. Our ventures platform, not unlike yours, David, is very focused on this space. So it's a massive opportunity. It also creates risks, right? And the one thing I know for sure, we've come forward and said in the next five years, we'll decrease our... Um, greenhouse gas across all our portfolios by 20% between now and 2025. We'll make another statement between now and 2030. I like those five-year increments because to David's point, transition is essential, but does it come as quickly as you want it to? And I don't want to be insincere and go out and say, well, we'll be X, you know, way out down the road. Um, we will likely do that, but we'll do it in five-year increments, being very thoughtful, rolling up our portfolio, just trying to get it right. And it's a win-win-win-win-win. Your people want it, your plan members want it, your customers want it, society needs it, and we're all sharing the same planet. My only caution, and you'd know better than we would, I'd, I'd appreciate your thoughts, you know, Canada's unique, right? And we could be, and, and greenhouse gas, all emissions doesn't stop on some sovereign nation state border. Correct. And it's easy for, if there's 200 countries in the world, 150 can sign up to commitments and there's no harm, no foul, because it doesn't affect who they are. For our country, you know, are there opportunities to increase our emissions within our nation, but then to offset much greater emissions elsewhere for a period of time on the road to perfection? And when we sign up and think of it in such a parochial way, that always concerns me because I love Canada to be part of the solution, and um, you know, and we you, you don't want to sell Canada out without quickly finding adaptations, quickly finding new transitions, quickly finding ways that we can improve the improve the improve the world as opposed to uh, to just thinking parochially. So I'd no, appreciate it's, your it's, comment. It's a great, great point that you've raised, uh, Blake. So I'm the moderator here, so I'll be, I've done a lot of speaking. Uh, well, you've got more experience in this. <laughs> but I would say that, uh, to your point, you know, the, the problem and the challenge is global in nature. This is not a unique right. problem to Canada. And so I remember when we were in government uh, working with Mr. Trudeau at that time, we supported the LNG project. And I used the Strategic Innovation Fund uh, tool that I had as a, um, to help support companies, particularly, particularly uh, in, in areas where they can develop certain technologies. And we supported that project because it would offset the use of coal in Asia. Uh, so to your point. And so there were some activists, some environmentalists that were unhappy with that decision. Right. But in the grand scheme of things, uh, we felt that it was the right decision because it enabled us at a global level to deal with uh, displacing coal, particularly in Asia, and, and we were focusing a lot on China at that time. So that's the trick, right, is don't ask us all to, in our own isolated ways, put stakes in the ground. Let's collectively work together as a nation and get solutions together as a nation and, um, and try to avoid shaming people into you know, making commitments that then it becomes their own little pickup game. Yeah I, I think, yeah, I think the challenge is on this point, and without belaboring the issue, uh, is that the timelines. We're thinking 2030, and we've got a decade, or we have eight years left. The, the intensity, uh, if you look at all the commitments that have been made at COP26, they still don't enable a society as a whole or the international community to hit those targets. So there's just going to be a growing expectation to do more, and you're absolutely right, Blake. It is about coordination, 
collaboration, the private sector and government working together. Look, I, I want to end it on, on one point here because this has been a tremendous conversation. I want to thank you both. You know, there's a lot going on. We talked about sustainability. We talked about the pandemic and what that's meant for the digital transformation. We've talked about skills and culture. Um, but I think many people that are here uh, in this room and listening uh, online as well would love to get your perspective. I and mean, you've been very clear about how optimistic you are about the future. But what is, you know, your greatest worry for the next 10 years? What are you, what's, what keeps you up at night occasionally? I mean, if you do stay up at night worrying about this, we'd love to get your perspective. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. So if you could we'll start off with you, David, and then with you, Blake. Well, yes, and, and, and I hope this is going to go uh, gently, uh, not, not scare anyone or be offensive. But um, I want to commend you, Avdeep, on your work for LNG, for example. It's a little known fact, and it's pretty inconvenient, maybe an inconvenient truth, that <laughs> despite the fact that the United States did not sign or approve the Kyoto Protocols and, and withdrew from the Paris Protocols, the only reason that the United States met their obligations of CO2 reduction and that Europe blew past them with increases was that the United States had fracking. And fracking, which is given a bad name, but really is a great technology, uh, unleashed so much natural gas that it reduced the relative price of the absolute price of natural gas below coal dramatically. So the utility companies of their own accord shifted from coal to natural gas. That has a much lower CO2 output and so it was very unintentional. The government said, do this. Private, sec private sector did something entirely different. And the, and the result was beneficial for the world. And I, I think <clears throat> what I would like to see is less barriers. For example, more pipelines, not fewer pipelines, more LNG uh, ports and, and, and the ability to move it around because energy is a very um, local and a very global commodity. We need it to flow and not be bottlenecked and stuck uh, due to regulation or due to short supply shortages. So I'm for uh, everything. Let's put more nuclear, let's put more natural gas. Let's do it in pipelines and in LNG tankers, and as well as do research for new technologies that can be, say, zero emissions that are non-nuclear. Nuclear is obviously a great choice for zero emissions. So, And there's a lot of um, new technology in the nuclear realm that people don't understand. There's possible potential for the fusion in the future, but even in the new uh, nuclear plants that are being built, they're, they're small, they're portable, they're much, much um, different than what we were thinking about uh, from, say, 30, 40 years ago. Technology is keeping advancing, and um, I think a lot of people need an update on their knowledge of the technology because it's so much different than most of our um, intuitions from, again, 30, 40 years ago. It's a new world. Yeah, look, I agree with you, David, and you said we're going to need lots more energy. Uh, there's a growing middle class uh, people when uh, they move up. Uh, the, the up in society in terms of their wants and needs are going to require more, not less. So we're going to have to look at that in a very thoughtful way. So that's a definite worry and, and an opportunity as well, as you put it. So Blake, you have the final word. Yeah, no, I think I've never lost sleep over a deal. I've never lost sleep over some restructuring or some concern geopolitically. I, I always lose sleep over people. And, and are we setting people up for success? And are we giving them a fair crack? My job is to make sure that 530,000 pensioners get paid for decades and decades to come. And I don't want to put a mortgage on that, their future, that means they can't be receiving the promise we owe to them. I worry as a society that when we take on too much debt, we put mortgage on a future generation of our kids that they can't sustain. And I just worry about future generations, particularly at, at my age and stage. And there's a great book, I don't know if, if people have read it, Simon Sinek, called The Infinite Game. And his point was there are finite games and infinite games. Finite games have a whistle, it starts, it ends, it's chess, it's when the Leafs win tonight. It's <laughs> like you'll get it in you know, no time. And you know there's a winner and loser. But we, most of us, play an infinite game. And most of us play a game where you have to take whatever you're handed. I happen to be handed an amazing platform, divert existential threats, and set it up for future generations to succeed, and leave this campsite way better than how I found it. And so those are the things. Are the decisions I'm taking today, 5, 10, 15 years, looking after people, those are the things that concern me the most. Well, what a wonderful note to, to leave this conversation on. Thank you very much, both Blake and David, for your candidness and thoughtfulness. And thank you uh, for the audience here and those joining, joining us virtually as well. This was a great conversation about 
not what's happening today, but what's going to happen 10, 15 years from now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.